I think at the end of the day, the destruction of our institutions began, right, with the assault on on those godly foundations, family in particular. And here we have a guy who speaks at a Catholic college graduation. And essentially, from everything I'm reading and watching and looking at what he said, espouses a very strong, traditional, biblical worldview of, ma of father and mother and kids. I, I reference this, and I'm going to give both of you an opportunity to speak on this. And David, I would love you to come in from even from a Jewish perspective, because in a, you know, he talked about what's laid out in the Torah relative to how a house is to be run. And again, as a Christians, we look back to that and say, that's what God's word says. So I don't know, how, whoever wants to start. Let me, I'll, I'll start. First of all, I think the most telling thing is the backlash against it, because these are words that aren't allowed to be said in America. Since the birth control, literally since the invention of birth control in 1960, and the, you have a downward flight of the, of the family and a diminution of the role of the mother and the wife and the stay-at-home homemaker as being a viable part of society and because it didn't fit the mode of trying to break down the family unit. And that doesn't say that people can't go off and you know, have careers and do the like because, quite honestly, it's, you know, we are in a choice world. But to diminish... Those who choose to have to raise their children and make that their focus, who maybe give up a career to go to raise their children and put their, their family first, is what has been happening for 40 years in an effort to discourage women from taking a role which many women are very happy to take. And that is a, and are very satisfied in that role. So it is a, so the backlash against it shows how dangerous this thought is because of how appealing it is. And if you wanted to have proof of that, Harrison Buckter's, his jersey, the female version of his jury, jersey, because the NFL produces a male version and a female version. The female version of his jersey has sold out. He has been overwhelmed with invitations to speak to women's groups about, not men's groups, not men and male empowering groups to women's groups because he's one of the first people in the last 20 years is actually affirm a, the role of homemaker as being a viable role in this society. And that is dangerous to those who are trying to tear apart the family and those who are trying to tear apart our society. I love this part of his speech when he opens up. Bad policies and poor leadership have negatively impacted major life issues, things like abortion, IVF, surrogacy, euthanasia, as well as growing support for degenerate cultural values in media all stem from the pervasiveness of disorder. Wow. Look, there's two levels in which this is disturbing phenomenon. One is from a not substantive point of view, the freedom of speech. Here's a man who expresses his values to an audience that is a private university that is sharing his values. And they're trying to shut him down from being able to do that. This is America. You should be able to say what you think. As long as it's not screaming fire in a theater, you should be allowed to say what you have to say. Number, the reason why they're so upset about it is because he's not a minor figure. He has some popularity being who he is. They don't want, again, they don't want anybody. They want to make taboo. They want to make you beyond the pale. If you have opinions they don't agree with. So they try to dehumanize your right to have an opinion, not to dehuman, not to criticize your opinion, but to actually strip you of your right to have an opinion. And that's what's going on here on the sort of principle level of freedom of speech. Whether it's a leftist Marxist going to talk to a Marxist club, although that gets, in my view, pretty close to screaming fire in a theater because they advocate revolution. But let's, you can have uh, somebody going and talking with some group that agrees with them. Uh, that's fine. I, it's not my group, whatever. So that's number one. Number two, as far as the, the values, and is, is substantively, what he says is what is in the Bible, as, as we Jews call the Tanakh, the Torah, 
Nevi'im Ketuvim, which is uh, the, the Bible, the Torah, the prophets, and the, the writings, the three parts of the Old Testament. And it's consistent with what's in there. And an Orthodox Jew, a religious Jew, Torah is not smorgasbord, a breakfast. It's not a breakfast buffet. You can't just pick what you want out of context and choose what you want to choose and ignore the rest. It's a package. And the package is pretty clear about certain things, family, human life, etc. So this is not, apart from that, it's not, it is not a communist talking to a communist group, which is an extreme organization talking to a group of people who believe in extremism. This is the foundation of what the West has believed for, 4, 000, for three, four thousand years in its evolution. This is not extremists. To deny that, to dehumanize that, that or to, to strip him of his right to even say that, it's a very short line to any major religions. And if you just to interject, it's not lost on me that he spoke at a university at a commencement ceremony. He was invited by the university, Catholic university, and he did something, he spoke words that shared the values of the Catholic faith. So that's a, so where's the shock? But when you look at the people who are criticizing him, they're perfectly okay with, pe with, with people taking over campuses, denying people the ability to go to college, uh, you know, advocating for the death of all Jews worldwide for international jihad. Absolutely fine with those people having a, ha doing that. They're, they're against police breaking up demonstrations which are designed to disrupt and destroy, um, not speech, disrupt, disrupt and destroy. They are they are against that, and there's no outrage from the left on that. But some place kicker from the Kansas City Chiefs, who let's just be honest, place kickers are just above punters. No, just they're above punters. There's snappers, place kickers, holders, and kickers. Okay, so the kickers are below snappers, or above snappers and holders. So they're pretty low on the NFL totem pole, but. So that we have a place kicker who is being demonized by those who won't say anything about people on college campuses who are destroying the capacity of others to get, go to class and who are breaking things, taking over buildings, and engaging in, in violent behavior, all in support of murderous thugs who started a fight and got mad because they're afraid because the Israelis are going to finish it. Okay? That's the bottom line here. So I look at behavior, and the behavior of the left is to hold hands off the leftists and the communists and the is Islamists allies that they have in, in America, hands off of them. But if you dare say something that supports traditional Western values, biblical values, suddenly you're a pariah and should be and there's calls to kick you out of the NFL. Well, as Andy Reid said, his coach, if, they can, if he goes, I go. Of course, he's because he's a really good place kicker. But <laughs> Let me just jump into that for a second, too. I was talking in my dialogue on this in the in last hour. Here we have somebody like a Tyreek Hill who has 10 children with five different women and yep. yet is cel that kind of behavior is celebrated. Now, again, as I said, I'm not going after Tyreek Hill, quite frankly, is only 30 years old. In Jewish custom, at 30 years of age, you are just becoming a man just becoming a man uh that is a reality we have and and we're not raising we're not producing men and harrison butker brings that to light predicated on how out of order the household is he says that's the reason we're not raising men women have the responsibility of raising children to a particular age and then there needs to be a man a father figure that steps in and brings that young boy to manhood. And unfortunately, men are responsible. Men are responsible for the fact that better than 50% of children are raised in single family homes. Men are responsible. It takes a man and a woman to get pregnant. Where are the men? The abortion problem predominantly is a, is a, is a male problem. I'm not, yes, women, are there's this fight and but the reason men have been told 
once you make your contribution, you have no more say. I understand. Okay? I, mean, I agree. So Legally, you're well, right. This is the philosophical end for that whole approach. Yep. There's no responsibility. There's no accountability. There's no say once a woman gets pregnant. And as a result, there's no so then why, why would you expect people to be held responsible and feel like they're responsible afterwards? It's that's all that's all that's that's so we've created a philosophical point in men's minds where they don't, and since they don't have a say from the beginning, they sit there and they walk away from the accountability at the end. And that's the danger of the philosophy that's been pushed by the glorious Steinems and the Betty Friedans. I think the other part of it is that there's no men in the home to raise up that well, boy to begin with. Stay? Why would they stay? No, no, listen to what, what, what I'm saying is that the feminist movement of the 60s, yeah. as it was propagated and began to destroy, this is what Phyllis Schlafly fought so vehemently no. against. It, 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 what it did was, is, I hear what you're saying. We have progressed to a legal system that gives men no. I'm not I'm talking philosophically. We're on the same page. I, but what? But no, we are. But what I was suggesting is that because there's no man in the home, you have women that are turning out boys. It doesn't matter how old they are. They can be thirty. They can be forty. They can be fifty. Predominantly speaking, if you're under the age of fifty right now and you didn't have a dad, you nobody told you how to be a man. I think this is part of the larger movement on the left to create a society without responsibility. It's not only the men, it's overall this idea that you can't be a criminal. So he does something. He did it probably because he was hungry or whatever. There's no consequences unless, of course, uh, you're in the wrong political side, in which case it isn't a consequence to your actions. It's a, it's a consequ consequence to who you are. So if you are uh, a, a white suburban woman, you're part of the violence against whatever, the whole DEI thing. But, but if you commit a crime, it's not your fault. It's society's fault. So there's this grouping of responsibility. And I think what's really behind it is this destructive impulse toward nihilism, which is the precursor for their transformation of society into a totalitarian structure. Every totalitarian ideology begins with anarchy and with nihilism. And that's what you're seeing here with these progressive values being pushed. Nobody's talking about rounding up people, the LGBT, and stripping them of their human rights. We're talking about whether society has a right to maintain its fundamental structures of survival. And moreover, whether people who have certain values that aren't progressive are allowed to have those values. Well, I'm, I'm going to push back on you, David, because it's the truth. The, the LGBTQ community, and particularly those who are pushing uh, gender-altering drugs, are, doing, are engaging in child abuse. So they are. are engaging in child abuse, and we have a responsibility to protect our children from child abuse. If somebody sits there and they're, in their, they're 20 years old, they say, gee whiz, I want to do that. That's between them and their doctor, but don't make me pay for it, okay? Well, I think we, we, let me, we are creating a society where it is, you are deemed to be weird if you don't and put your right. pronouns behind and you. Let me, and let me just add on, Rick, to what you're saying in, in, in supporting that. And I think, David, ultimately you're coming around, you agree with us on, on, on this. No, I agree. I just and, knows we're yeah. not a society where we're going to take somebody who's gay and throw them off a roof. I don't That's disagree with you, but here's the thing, here's the thing to understand. Right. But here's the thing to understand. We would not allow, and we do not allow, drug dealers to sit at right. the entrance of grammar schools and pass out drugs. We do not allow the teacher to bring a fifth of vodka into the classroom and get the kids hooked on alcohol. We don't allow those kinds of behaviors to take place. We don't tell children, although we are now in a lot of these big cities, but we never used to tell kids that it was okay to go into a store and steal and rob and take things off the shelf without paying for them, and that was okay. We, we, we didn't do that. And, 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 and we must yeah. society maintain. We're not, we don't allow a pedophile 
to go to a child's library or a reading room in a child in a library. Actually, we do. Actually, probably. Well, and, 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 well, and actually, and we tell parents that if they read the pornographic material at a school board meeting, that the teacher is forcing their daughter to read at the front of the classroom, that the parent can't read it in front of a bunch of adults. But the seven-year-old or the nine-year-old daughter that had to read that in front of the class, oh, that's perfectly okay. We're going to make them do that. Every one of those school board members should be pulled out of their seats, beaten to death. Absolutely. And then you had it with the Virginia school. Sorry, maybe not to death, but they need to get their shit kicked out of them. They need to be unelected. Let's put it that way. Oh. Yeah, they need to be unelected. No, I'm, well, what I'm trying to say is nobody's going to go kill everybody who's gay. But the problem here is when they turn that into a political ideology they impose on the rest of us to destroy our values and deny us the right to live our lives. And the truth is American society as a whole relies on the values that are grounded in the Bible. A society must have a set of values around which to organize. And we what they're advocating is the annulling an, of any norms, annulling of any values. If you want to wreck your own life, not your child's life, but your own life, and you want to do what you want to do, you want to take, you want to drink too much, I'm not going to be able to stop you. But if you want to pose alcoholism on my child or me and make that the norm and say that if you don't engage in alcoholism and get drunk every day, then you will be punished. That's what we're facing right now with the, with this with this issue. They are imposing their nihilism on us. There's no doubt. And yeah. one of the things I going back to an earlier point, you have a this attack on what men are supposed to be doing and how you don't have men in the households. Ultimately, a man's role is as the protector. That's our role. We're the protector. If you make it so men are disassociated from their role then there's no one to protect. And when you destroy the, so when you destroy the protection, the moral protections and leadership, as well as the physical protection, when you destroy the protectors, at that juncture, you are, the society is easily destroyed from those who would destroy. And that's why the attack on males and the attack in the schools on children, boy children, and trying to get them to behave like girls in the schools. The truth of the matter is, boys like to run into each other. They like to stare and pound on each other. It's part of what boys do. It is a, we roll around in the dirt, we get dirty, we get cuts, we skin our knees. That's part of growing up. And when you sit there and you say, no, you're going to so you're going to play inside in a safe little cloistered world. And here, we're going to put a screen in front of you and occupy your brain with, uh, with games. At that juncture, is becoming a boy in a natural sense, becoming a man. They're not learning the basic that, gee whiz, if I go off and punch somebody, they might punch me back and that would hurt. So if you never learn that, it's very easy to be a bully because you can be a bully online easily. But if you get punched one, you get punched in the nose a couple of times, you recognize maybe I need to alter my behavior. And that's part of growing up as a boy. And that is, and that's how you get socialized as a boy. It is for us to sit there and pretend otherwise and to destroy the ability, boy's ability to have those experiences by limiting them to, gee, you're not allowed to use, leave, leave the yard and actually go off and, and have adventures. You're destroying the essence of becoming a man. And that moral compass is the other piece to that. And again, I know the argument being we're not going to throw, and, and we're not throwing people off of roofs, but we're not going to legalize a deviant behavior. And that's what we've done. We have legalized deviant behavior. And so now, and I have pushed back on this, as I know HSLDA has, has and so has the parentalrights.org, which have said, look, you can't be teaching fisting and teaching deviant sexual practices in sex education courses in public schools and then expect to have some kind of a moral culture. It, it's going to work. And one of the first things they went after, going back to where we started about 10 or 15 minutes ago, is who's at home 
trying to make sure that Susie and Johnny have some kind of direction and bearing in their lives if we've created a cultural situation where both mom and dad are having to work in order to just feed the family and keep a roof over their head. And that's become the norm and the priority. It's what's destroying the family because now you've got two, basically it's two alphas in the house as opposed to actually having somebody who is a taking care of the house and holding that together while you've got someone else that's out doing the hunting who comes back home recognizing where they're supposed to bring what they've hunted. Look, every marriage that works very quickly settles into sort of roles. Namely, even if you're doing something simple like cleaning the house, every couple that works, even without negotiating it, the guy does this, the woman does that, It's and, and it may change from person to person, but by and large, there's a division of roles and there's an understood way that works. And what's happening here is the building block of Western civilization is the family. And a family can only work as a unit with cooperation and division of roles. This attempt at narcissism, that everybody needs to get everything they want all the time, and you have no obligation to the person with you, no obligation to be faithful to your wife, for your wife to be faithful to you. Just do what you feel like doing. That's fine. That's the unraveling of the building block of our civilization. But that's exactly what they're after. If you look at what they really want to go for, they're going to re, they're going to in, install a much less free structure than that. They're going to impose rules on everybody in a totalitarian way. The goal right now is just to destroy the family foundation because at the end, the family is the strongest barrier to to extreme political ideas and extreme political governance. You destroy oh. you destroy the family and then you gain complete. You can justify taking the children outside of the structure since the structure doesn't work. And the family members will say, oh, yeah, let's absolutely let's do that. We just don't have time to, to engage with the children. And right. you know, ultimately, it's a matter of uh, it's a matter of taking children's mind. By the way, one of the interesting things that happened after Trump won in 2016, the left went nuts because they, they thought they had affected the generations enough that Trump couldn't rise. And what and so they they were pretty much shocked. And the idea was, gee, maybe we need to get them before the age of seven or eight in the public schools. We need to now have mandatory preschool, which is one of was one of Biden's proposals, mandatory preschool. So we are in, we're engaging in, in indoctrination and separating the child from the family roots and the foundation that gets planted at a very early age. And for my Texas friends, I, I just want to remind you that Governor Greg Abbott, in his first term, his number one priority was mandatory preschool for four-year-olds. Mandatory preschool for four-year-olds by the supposed Republican governor of Texas. Let me let you, I know you want to, let me let you jump in, David, and then I want to take, there's two paragraphs out of Harrison Butker's speech that I just want to say really quickly because they're the whole they're the whole reason why we started this conversation. But go ahead. No, I just wanted to say, look, the first thing that Mao Zedong did and the first thing Pol Pot did in their communist systems was destroy the family because the family was the biggest barrier to their absolute power. And it, that's what's really going on here. These are people who grew up reading the works of Marx of Lenin and certainly of Mao and Che Guevara and others who took their cues from this. So here's what he said. For the ladies present today, congratulations on an amazing accomplishment. You should be proud of all that you've achieved to this point in your young lives. I want to speak directly to you briefly because I think it is you, the women, who have had the most diabolical lies told to you. How many of you are sitting here now about to cross the stage and are thinking about all the promotions and titles you are going to get in your career? Some of you may go on to lead successful careers in the world, but I would venture to guess that the majority of you are most excited about your marriage and the children you will bring into this world. I can tell you that my beautiful wife, Isabel, would be the first to say 
that her life truly started when she began living her vocation as a wife and as a mother. I'm on the stage today and able to be the man that I am because I have a wife who leans into her vocation. I'm beyond blessed that the many talents God has given me, but it cannot be overstated that all of my success is made possible because a girl I met in band class back in middle school would convert to the faith, become my wife, and embrace one of the most important titles of all homemakers. And the response, 18 seconds of a standing ovation. And, that's, and that scares the left every bit as much as 100,000 people in Wildwood, New Jersey for Trump. And then he says this, just to be clear that he was speaking to both the girls and the boys. To the gentlemen here today, part of what plagues our society is this lie that has been told to you, that men are not necessary in the home or in our communities. As men, we set the tone of the culture. And when that is absent, disorder, dysfunction, and chaos set in. This absence of men in the home is what plays a larger role, a large role in the violence we see all around the nation. Other countries do not have nearly the same absentee father rates as we find here in the U.S., and a correlation could be made in their drastically lower violence rates as well. Be unapologetic in your masculinity, fighting against the cultural emasculation of men. Do hard things. Never settle for what is easy. You might have a talent that you don't necessarily enjoy, but if it glorifies God, maybe you should lean into that over something that you might think suits you better. I speak from experience as an introvert who now finds myself as an amateur public speaker and an entrepreneur, something I never thought I'd be when I received my industrial engineering degree. When we reach the end of our lives, the simple question is what's left? What, what do we bequeath to the world? What leaves our mark? What makes us, what makes our life any purpose? What, and so you made a lot of money, you got a lot of promotions, et cetera. You die, there's nothing left, nothing. You literally are just dust. However, if you had children and you had a family, then you have left your mark on the world. So these people who keep talking about thinking not about yourself, they're hyper virtue signaling and they keep talking about the causes they support and so on and so forth. At the end of the day, the cause that matters is your charm. And well, that's what they do not acknowledge. It's all self-centered virtue signaling otherwise. And everyone can play a role in in helping with that next generation. Absolutely. There are people who can't have children, but they can be godfathers. They can be teachers. They can leave a mark on the children of those they love. Yeah. I understand that. And it is a tragedy for them. They don't have children. I, I, I get that. But this idea, that everything is about your promotion, your career, the money you make. It's the ultimate materialist, materialistic and superficial way to live through life. But that's exactly what the left is trying to raise as a virtue for everybody graduating, men and women. Yeah, 100%. I agree wholeheartedly. At, 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 at the end of the day, recognize what, what really has value, and it's the relationships and what you leave behind is those that you have impacted in the generation that comes up behind you. And Rick, I know you do that with the Sunday school. You've been teaching Sunday school for for decades. Yeah, and my, and my touching wife does ones. education programs in yep. church, and I've done Sunday school youth group and all all that. And it's I'm gonna just deviate a little bit from where from what's been said in that we're called to follow God. We're fo called to follow Christ, and we follow Christ where Christ leads us. And that's a, and that could be to having a brilliant career and discovering stuff that saves millions upon millions of lives. It could lead to being a law enforcement officer. It could be, lead to being a pastor. It can lead to any number of different things that you do. The, the critical thing that Harrison Butker was saying there about that, about men being, if you're talented in something, but you're called to do something else, is that is called being obedient to God. That's obedience. 
And I'll go Old Testament here because Moses is sitting out in the desert. He's eight years old. He's a shepherd. God comes to him in a burning bush and says, hey, dude, I've, I've got this idea. Why don't you going to lead a nation? And he says, I can't speak. What do you mean I'm going to lead it? I, I can't speak. I'm going to go talk to Pharaoh. God already has sent Aaron on his way to get to get Moses. So he sent somebody who spoke. By the way, who we never encounter speaking ever in, in front of Pharaoh. And he ends up, the only time we know he spoke is he let a golden calf be built. So, it's, so Aaron didn't exactly distinguish himself. Moses was chosen and he obeyed. And God provided a tool, a crutch, an Aaron, that made him feel comfortable that he could that he would succeed. But ultimately, it was Moses doing what Moses was told to do to meet his destiny, to free the people, to lead them across to the promised land, and take them right to the brink of the promised land, at which point uh, he was denied entrance. But he did what he was supposed to do. We all, maybe not that big of a deal, but we're all called to follow God. Every one of us, whether you believe in God or not, he's still calling you to follow him. Amen. You are his creation. Yep. And, in, and for Christians, that means keeping our eyes on the cross and doing what we are supposed to do. And that means being people who are, who are both are through the way we live our lives, but also the things we say and the interactions we have to go and make disciples. That's what we're called to do. And for Jewish people, they're called to, to bring others to the faith, to introduce others to God. This is the simple task. Harrison Butker said that. Uh -huh. In so many words, he said that. And that. If people did what Harrison Butker said in terms of doing what God has in mind for you and knew what God's will is for your life and sought that will, single-mindedly and kept their eyes on the cross, kept their eyes on God and were and moved forward based on what was opened up for them and what wasn't, you would have this world would be a dramatically better place. And all the social ills that we talk about would go away. Israel had problems. Israel had problems. They had people Moses is up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments and they're all busy breaking them before he can get the, the stones down from the mountain. Moses has to go up and rewrite him himself because God said, I did it once, now you do it. But it's a, but you get down to it. We have the instruction manual. It's the Bible. It's a, it is an instruction manual. It is true from beginning to end. And it's something that's, you can say, I don't agree with it. But if you want to argue with God, the creator, have at it. Guess what? He created this earth, and he's just like your mom used to tell you, oh, I brought you into this world, I can take you out. God actually is that guy, so you might pay attention a little bit to what he says. But you do because what you do, because it's the right thing to do, and it's an expression of your faith. It is not because you are virtue signaling. Right. Look how good I am. It's not based on narcissism. And the entirety of the whole progressive value system, whether it's Greta, uh, with Sundberg in Sweden or so forth, taking the right causes and virtue signaling, right, and various levels of aggressiveness. That's yeah. absolutely true. That, yep. is, that is absolutely true. And to end on, oh. end on a simple visual, when Christ was observing the, the giving of the money at the temple, and some and the Pharisees and, and rich people were going and dumping all these coins into these tin pans that were very loud. Everybody could say, oh, look at how much money that guy gave. And Jesus pointed to a woman who had a single mite, and she gave all she had. And he said, she gave more than all the others combined because she gave what she had. And she didn't do it. She didn't do it out of look at me. She meekly went up and put her and hers in as she was, but didn't look around and say, that, and given all I have. No, she did what she was supposed to do without claiming credit because the credit, the glory is to God. The glory is not to man. And if you take the glory, then you've taken away 
God's glory and you lose whatever value it. You it lose the blessing. Of. That's exactly right. Yep. You lose and the by blessing. By the way, it's probably the hardest thing not to go around and brag on yourself. So it's a, those of us who are in the public sphere, we're talking all the time. You know, it's really hard not to go around and say, oh, I did this and I did that. Because That's why I have a hard time talking about India, guys, to be honest. Because I look at what's happened over there and I'm like, wow, it's amazing. And I want people to know and I want people to support it. But I don't want to make it sound like I did anything because I didn't do anything. Right. God did it. God's the one who planted all those churches. God's the one who allowed us to put in all those wells. God's the one who is healing people and saving lives and turning a community around. It's God's the one who's doing it, not Pastor Greg. I'm stunned sitting here in, in a room that's right next to my bedroom, having the opportunity to be able to just simply share. And it's God who saved my life. And he's the only reason I'm still here today. That's 100% true. I don't think we could end on a better note. God bless you all. Have a great rest of your Monday. And uh, we'll be back, all three of us, with you next week, if the Lord allows us to. And I'll be back with you on Wednesday. And on Friday, I'm going to have a special treat for you. I just watched Masters of the Air. I don't know if you guys have seen that one. It's the follow-up to Band of Brothers. Okay. So it's the Air Force. It's about the 100th Battalion. And the, they called them the Bloody Battalion because of what happened to them and how many lost their lives. But I'm going to have a member of the 8th Air Force. He's 100 years old, and he's going to be a guest on my program on Friday. And as we honor our veterans on this Veterans Day, God bless you all.